I read recently that the average adult spends 23 hours a week texting. 23 hours a week texting. That seemed crazy to me, and then I found out even more to the statistic, and that is this. Over 15 million texts are sent every minute of every day, and that's not including app-to-app messaging. Many of the students might know what that is. But those two stats, they astonished me this week, but what is more mind-blowing than all of that is this comparison. It was only 156 years ago that the fastest form of communication in the United States was the Pony Express. (laughs) The only way that you could have gotten a message across the nation would have been a pony. I love how they don't even call it a horse, they call it a pony. I mean, there's like no hope at all of it reaching its destination. And now we have text messaging. We have all forms of communication. Forms of communication have changed greatly throughout history. We, we read some of the, the annals of history and we find that dispatch was all they had. And then it turned to telegraph, to probably 100 other forms of communication all in between there. As I thought of that this week, I thought of the many different forms of communication that God has used throughout millennia. Before Scripture was complete, He used dreams, visions, and other forms of what we call special revelation that inspired His men to write Scripture. But with the Bible complete, I I don't put too much stock in dreams, and you shouldn't either. If God still uses this if God still uses dreams, they take a back seat to Scripture. Here's what I mean by that. If your dream says something contrary to the Bible, it's wrong. And you're wrong for giving it just the time of day. Scripture supersedes all other forms of communication. God will never tell you something specially outside of the bounds of Scripture. But before its completion... God used all these different forms of communication, visions, dreams, special revelation. All throughout Scripture, God used angels to declare his will to his people. In fact, angel means messenger. For some reason, and I suspect bad theology, artists look or they took to rendering the angels as chubby, childlike cherubs, you know, like I mean, pansy things, when there's absolutely no biblical reason for us to look at angels that way. On the contrary, angels are described more like warriors than children. They're often referred to in hosts, which is a military term. It was frightening to encounter. If you add to that, the very first words from pretty much every angel experience, from every angelic encounter, what's the first thing the angel says to the person they're coming to see? Fear not. I don't see a chubby baby saying, fear not. (laughs) There's nothing to be scared of there. I think the fear was incited by a few things. Number one, the suddenness of this appearance. It could have been anything that wasn't there and then was there, and it would have startled the person, so fear not. It could have been their appearance, what the angel of light actually looked like. But thirdly, and probably more importantly all throughout these accounts in Scripture, what scared or what caused fear to fall upon those who saw the vision, saw the angel, was the message that the angel brought. For this young girl in Luke 1, that we've already read about, I am certain that it was a culmination of all three of these. The suddenness of the angel appearing, the appearance of the angel, and then to add on top of that what this angel's message is to Mary. Verse 26, now in the sixth month, that's of Elizabeth's pregnancy, it's spoken of earlier in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. 
More than anything that bothered Mary about this sudden appearance was the visitor's greeting. He calls her highly favored one. He says, the Lord is with you. All throughout the Christmas account, we see Mary pondering and considering several times. We read the passage where Mary kept all these things in her heart. She pondered, she considered them often, she mulled them over, and I believe she does that here as well. But this is a distressed pondering. Probably asking yourself, why am I highly favored? Why why is the Lord coming to me? Or why is the Lord with me? Why am I blessed among women? I would suggest it's this. Mary had an accurate view of God and an accurate view of herself. She knew her faults and her failures. And she also knew the holiness of God. She understood that. It's ironic to me that the Roman Catholic Church would choose this passage as the basis for them supposing that they should pray prayers to Mary. Based upon this verse, Mary would be the very first one to be troubled by a Hail Mary. She is troubled when she hears that I am favored, that the Lord is with me, that I'm a blessed, I'm blessed among women. So let's get back to that idea of she knowing her faults and failures and also knowing the holiness of God. Have you ever been hiking in a national park or a wildlife reserve and had a deer come right up to you? A few months ago, we were hiking or we were camping in a national park in Arizona and I was getting breakfast together and, and Rachel was getting the girls dressed and I looked up and about 20 feet away from us was this huge elk that stood about shoulders above me and it walked right through our sight. It was not scared of me at all. That's because those animals, they've never been hunted. They have always been around humans. They don't even know how dangerous humans can be to them. Or maybe they knew how undangerous I would be to that animal. But that's kind of how many are with God. They have never been presented with a God who is holy and is a just judge that he is. And so they don't even know that they should hold him in reverence. They don't even know the danger that they're in and being in his presence. That's not Mary. Mary has sat at the feet of God in worship. And when she is called highly favored one of God's messenger, she doesn't understand because she knows her sinful nature and she knows the holy nature of God. That's why she was troubled by this greeting. But that's not anywhere near where all of the astonishment stops with Mary. Not even close. If you've ever studied the Christmas story in detail, you've probably come up with the issue of trying to age Mary. Scholars have tried to pinpoint how old she might have been during this time. The trouble is nowhere in the Bible are we given her age. It's only said that she was young. Aside from that, we have the cultural norms of that day to help us find somewhat of an answer. She was not yet married herself, although she was given in marriage. And most would agree that Mary is between 12 and 18 years old, believing that 18 would be on the very old side of the spectrum, most likely in the middle there. She is 12 to 18 years old when she is visited by this angel who relays God's message to her. Your daughters are that age. Can you imagine her being struck with this wild message? Ladies, do you remember where you were when you found out that you were having your first child? Just, th just think about that for a little while. I'm sure that there was a flood of emotions, happiness, and fear, especially depending upon the situation which brought it all about. Even in our hardest modern day scenarios, they don't even come close to the fear and loneliness that this teenager felt as the next few verses unfold. The fear of physical pain 
I'm sure, coupled with the emotional distress that comes with an unwed motherhood, alongside with the social stigma attached to Mary's condition, it just all compounds itself. If she told anybody, they would laugh at her. But how in the world could she keep this thing a secret? And so I want you to, to feel that as Gabriel says in verse 30, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Hearing that this virgin girl would give birth brought so many emotions, so many questions. I'm sure for Mary it ranged from the biological questions to the theological questions. How could this be? But before Mary even has the chance to ask this question, Gabriel goes into detail about how special this child will be. He goes on in verse 32 and he says, Mary, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Everything in me can see a less respectful Mary say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, who cares about the child's name, Gabriel? I'm not interested in all the titles that are going to come here. How is this even possible? Don't tell me his name. I mean, within the first 10 seconds of meeting this gentleman visitor, she has been told, you're having a child as a young, unwed mother who has never slept with a man, and this is what you're going to name him. <laughs> It seems like you're putting the cart before the horse there, Gabriel. But you have to understand that Gabriel has waited a long time to proclaim that name, Jesus. A long time. First Peter tells us that he and the hosts of angels with him desire to look into the salvation of mankind. It's almost presented as, as if it's the angel's hobby in heaven. That it's the thing on earth that they receive the most joy investigating, studying, looking into the salvation, the redemption of mankind. So if you feel like Gabriel is just steamrolling over Mary with this news, with all these facts, with all these titles, with this name, just know that he has been waiting for millennia for this moment. You will call him Jesus because he's going to save. Salvation, Mary. You'll call him Jesus because he will save. When an angel tells Joseph, Mary's betrothed husband, the news a little later, he's going to add, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Essentially, Gabriel is saying, I'm not talking about a political savior. I'm not talking about someone who will make Israel great again. I'm talking about a savior from sin, Joseph. I'm talking about the long-awaited Messiah, Mary. You're going to give birth to him. And Gabriel's description says all of that in just a few words. He says, you're going to name him Jesus. Yeshua, Yahweh, saves. God saves. You looked for Moses to save you from the Egyptians, Mary, he died. Joshua to deliver you into the promised land, he died. Saul to make a name for you, he died. David to establish you, he died. Solomon to prosper you, he died. All these played their role, but only Jesus can save eternally. He calls him Yeshua. He will save. And then he says, he will be great. He will be great. I, I know it might sound simple, but in the Greek language, it's megas. He will be mega, Mary. His life will define 
greatness. A few verses earlier in Luke chapter 1 verse 15, John the Baptist was called great in the eyes of the Lord. But here with Jesus, when he is called, he will be great. There is no qualifier. There is no attachment in the eyes of the Lord. It's not that some will think he's great and others are going to be on the fence about it. It's that he will be great regardless of people's opinion. (laughs) It is his essence To be great. And that's your son, Mary. But he doesn't stop there. He says that this child will be the son of the highest. He will be of the same essence as God himself. In no uncertain terms, Gabriel says, Mary, you will carry and give birth to the Son of God. And he says of him, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He is the promised one, Mary. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy. He is exactly what God had in mind that first evening he took Abraham out into the desert And he told him to look up into the sky and count the stars. And then he tells him to pick up a handful of sand and count the granules. That's the plan that I have for Israel, Mary. Numerous, consuming all others. And it's all fulfilled in your son. And the son of the highest that you'll be giving birth to. And almost to just kind of Keep it all on. He ends with two more statements. He says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's time. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. That's space. Essentially, he says, he will always reign everywhere, Mary. And Mary's just If she was from the southern part of Nazareth, we would say, bless her heart. (laughs) She is just taking it all in, going through the names and the titles and a lot of the prophetic terms that I'm sure she has been taught since she was a very little girl, not that she's much older now. Jesus? Yeshua? Like Joshua in in the Old Testament? Savior? Great as if, as if we can't find enough adjectives to give him. He's, just, he's great. The son of God. King. And with all that mouthful of good news that Gabriel just threw on her, she's still stuck as you, as you and I would be with the, I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> as she says in verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I don't know a man? And Gabriel, with with beautiful discretion and understanding, relays to this young girl the beautiful and miraculous, and I would insert even mystical thing that will happen to her. He says in verse 35, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And knowing that that probably in no way even begins to answer the question, how can this be? Gabriel ends the conversation in verse 37 by saying, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Davy, in my reading, pointed out this irony. He said of Gabriel, In the first encounter, Gabriel would inform Zacharias that his wife, Elizabeth, who could not get pregnant, will. Now, in this second encounter, Gabriel is informing Mary, who should not be pregnant, that she is about to be. Essentially, Elizabeth couldn't get pregnant, but would. Mary 
should not be pregnant, but will be. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Almost as if to us today, don't try to explain away the virgin birth. Study it and and learn to defend your faith. But you're not going to understand it. In our minds, we have possibilities and impossibilities, and that ranks way over into the impossibilities. But Gabriel says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. But how does Mary respond? Honestly, it was so It was hard for me this week in my study to not think of some of the girls in our church that would be in this age group, to think of my own daughters. How in the world would they respond to something like this? I'm sure she had a bunch more questions that she wanted to ask, and she probably had brand new questions every day. But the scriptural account simply yet profoundly closes with Mary energetically saying in verse 38, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, exclamation point, let it be to me according to your word. It's almost like, again, with this young girl that she's raising her hand and she's saying, ooh, pick me, choose me. I'll do it. This pondering, deep thinking, brilliant young woman hears all the details, knows the stigma, even maybe just a little. She might not completely understand it all. But she will probably carry the rest of her life, and I believe that it is reminded of Jesus often that the surrounding country knew that Jesus or knew that Jesus was born out of wedlock. They rub it in his face several different turns and I'm sure that that had repercussions on Mary's own life. She hears it all and she responds with let it be. Every word. Amen. As if to close out her prayer. So let it be. Amen. Astounding that that was her knee-jerk reaction. (laughs) She hears everything, and that's how she immediately responds. But even more astounding to me is that she doesn't rethink it once it's settled in later. She doesn't object once she starts to feel the differences. No, in, in fact, she composes a song and, he sing, and she sings it to her elderly cousin, Elizabeth. And it's found from verse 46 through 55. This is, I would say, literally, the first Christmas carol. I don't know if she penned it, if she wrote it all down, if she was so gifted that she could on the spot mesh it together, but it's written in poetic form. And I believe it is a song sung. And in it, she testifies of her salvation. She praises God for her testimony. She praises him for his power. She praises him for his mercy. And allowing her to carry the Christ child. And finally, in the all-encompassing 51 through 55, she just praises him for his sovereignty. She says, you are in control of everything and I will praise you no matter what comes. And so I'd like for us to end this evening by reading that, verses 46 through 55. The Song of Mary. Verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. 
For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him. From generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. She closes out her correspondence with the angel by saying, let it be. To go back to this morning's sermon, absolutely and totally willing, a woman after God's own heart to carry the heart of God. As I studied Mary this year, and I have dozens of other times before I just wanted us to I just wanted to encourage you this year there's a pendulum swing with most things in life and on one side we have those in Christendom and I'll use that term loosely who they will come to the very edge of, of even worshiping Mary and we ought not do that Because even in her song, she says that she has gotten salvation from the Lord. She's not to be worshipped. But then, I think for some of us, maybe on the more casual and not high church versions of, of Christianity, we have the tendency to downplay the role that this amazing woman played in the plan of God. And I hope this year no matter your, your gender, no matter how you, I hope you can put yourself in Mary's shoes and simply say, let it be. Every word that you want of me, Lord, let it be. And then open with, my soul magnifies you. My life makes yours, your name greater around me. I hope that's our prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I love you.